My fellow compatriots, our Patriot Chest is intended to engage in our communities, to foster true patriotism, and to help preserve our American history. We put this video together in order to share with you some of our techniques and some of the methods that we use in our presentations. Our chest contains a variety of items from the colonial and revolutionary period. These are replicas of toys, clothing, kitchen utensils, household items, hunting, and military equipment. Each of our presenters somewhat has their own set of items that they have based on their preferences. We began in 2013 after coordinating with our compatriots from the Georgia Society and using their traveling trunk list of equipment. Our startup was very slow, where most of the schools we contacted were reluctant to allow our presentations. However, we gradually found schools through our own members and their wives who happened to be teachers or their grandkids who were students or our associates in the DAR and CAR and using their contacts. As we started with just a few successes, our reputation grew and then the acceptances accelerated. Since 2013, we have had about 450 presentations and we have reached over 11,000 students here in Colorado. These presentations are given in their classrooms, or their lunch rooms, or their libraries, or gymnasiums, and even their football fields, where we would run groups of 20 to 30 through every 45 minutes. Occasionally we receive requests for presentations from scouting groups, from civic clubs, and from church groups. As our Patriot Chess grew in popularity, two other Colorado Society programs benefited. These programs were originally used in recruiting new members, and we presented those in the local fairs, the local holiday celebrations, and the living history gatherings that took place in Colorado. We have compatriot David's military camp with a tent, a table, chairs, cooking utensils, weapons, some real and some replicas, and how he presented those to the young people. And we also have compatriot Tom and his wife Jewel in their living history camp as they displayed their camping utensils, the clothing, the household items, and the foods of the colonial times, and how they presented those to the young people. Our society offers to set up one or both of these extra camps in conjunction with our Patriot Chess presentation. In warm weather months, we occasionally set up all three for the students to rotate through at about 20 or 30 students again in about 45 minute intervals. We have entertained and provided history lessons to as many as 850 students in a day where all three of these co-located presentations were used. Wearing a Continental Army or militia uniform is a must. And presenting while standing holding a musket is also desirable if the school allows it. Most schools will allow it if the gun is unloaded and if the students are not permitted to handle it. The uniforms and the musket draw lots of attention, curiosity, and respect. Again, this video is provided as an aid to new presenters speaking to young kids. And it's divided into three overlapping segments. The first being the engagement with the audience. And the second one would be show and tell of the items that are in the chest. And the third would be injecting history lessons and history stories as driven by the children's questions and their participation. Before beginning any presentation, it's best to ask the teacher 
how much time you have, and at what level have the students had exposure to the colonial and revolutionary periods. Knowing their level of understanding will help guide the presenter and to the details and of the stories of the history lessons that he goes into. We also ask for volunteers, a boy and a girl, uh, to help in distributing and uh, the items from the chest as we talk about each one. The children can easily don a Continental Army coat and a three-cornered hat that is easy for the boy to put over his clothes and there is a colonial dress and a bonnet that the girl can easily put over her own clothes as well. So let's begin. Let's look at the videos of how to start up these presentations. I'm Levi's grandpa. I'm but we both belong, as well as Mr. Mitchell, right? Mr. Hampton in the back to an organization called the Sons of the American Revolution. Each of us has a great-great-grandfather who either fought in the Revolution as part of George Washington's army, or was in the militia at that time, or was one of our founding fathers. So all of us, including this guy, had a grandfather who was back there at that time, okay? We're gonna have two parts of this. In the first one, we're gonna kinda of tell you what happened that led up to the Revolutionary War and our country coming into being, okay? We weren't always the United States, were we? Did you know that? At one point, you were all British subjects. We belonged to England. There was no United States of America. We were the British colonies in North America. So that was kind of different, huh? So we'll go forth with that. I have just three rules that I enforce, okay? I'm pretty strict about them. The first rule is ask lots of questions. If there's anything that you're wondering about, just stick your hand up in the air, okay? I'll get to you as fast as I can. We don't want you to forget anything. My second rule is be as quiet as you can so that I can hear questions as they come up. My ears don't work very well anymore, all right? And we want people to be able to hear answers too. So that's the second rule is be as quiet as you can. And the third rule is really important. I'm really strict about this one. Are you ready for the third rule? Have fun. That works for a third rule? Okay. Okay, my name is George Smith. I'm in, I'm in, yes, sir. My name is George Smith. Good for you. I gotta shake your hand. It's a good name. We're main, named after kings. We're in a group called the Sons of the American Revolution, and we can trace our family history back to the Revolutionary War. So we go back seven or eight generations to a soldier or a sailor or somebody who gave supplies to the revolution. And um, this is the kind of stuff we do. We dress in uh, costume, we go to schools, we march in parades, and we primarily tell people about what happened in the Revolutionary War. Greetings fellow citizens. I am Tom, and this is my wife, Jewel. We're the Wellborns. We are here on behalf of the Sons and Daughters of the American Revolution to give you a brief history lesson uh, in, in, that's consistent with your teachers. Um, before we start, could I ask all of you to stand up, please? Thank you. Um, could we have the ladies uh, come forward and sit in front? Yes. Yes, that'd be great. Thank you. Uh, young men, yes, you may now find a seat. Um, why did I just do that? Yes, courtesy, that's right. Yes, thoughtfulness, that's right. We, as gentlemen, in that period, always gave respect to our lovely ladies. They could be our mothers, they could be our sisters. And therefore, you gentlemen have done a wonderful job of allowing these ladies to sit in front and enjoy this presentation. Thank you. As I said before, we are with the sons and daughters of the American Revolution. We have ancestors who fought in the American Revolution, and you may too. So you may want to look into your history to find out about that. We're going to give a presentation. I'm going to uh, give a presentation on one of my ancestors who fought in the American Revolution, uh, Lieutenant William Cunningham, uh, who was a, owned a, uh, was a captain of a 20-gun brig called the Wilkes, and his wife, Elizabeth Whitten. My wife, Jewel, would you please explain what you're going to present? I will be presenting the home activities 
that we would commonly see in a revolutionary time frame. Um, some of the foods, some of the equipment, and maybe some of the chores that you would once be doing. As we move into our show and tell section, we observe the discussions of the chest items as they are shown to the students and held up for questions. And then they are passed around for the students to hold and, and observe them. Is that really what they wore in the war? It's exactly what they wore. And we can talk about that in just a little bit. When we do these, it's good to let the kids' questions kind of direct us where we go. We used to use set programs, and uh, that could be kind of, kind of boring, huh? If I was up here reading off of something to you, you'd all fall asleep. So we let the questions take us. So this is how the men would have looked pretty much in those times. This is how they would look if they were in the militia or really just people in the towns the and in the mountains. The At the beginning of the war. This is what we wore. We had no army. We had no uniform. This, this is what I wore at home when I went hunting. Mr. So Mitchell is dressed as a militiaman, okay? A militiaman would have worn this. I wasn't a regular soldier. Boots and long or short pants. He had a hunter's frock is the coat that he's wearing, right? We all had tricorn hats, three-sided hats, right? Lots of kids think these are pirate hats. There were pirates at that time, but this is what the, just about everybody wore at that time. It was very fashionable, yes? Um, so, um, what kind of guns did they use? Like, what, like, what's that called? There's two different kinds. This was called a musket. This was the main gun that the Continental Army used, okay? Musket has a smooth bore on the inside, like a shotgun. It's not very accurate. This was just something that 500 men would stand shoulder to shoulder, and they would fire in that direction, and you'd have 500 big balls like this going down the field. The people weren't very far away. They might only be as close as those windows down there when you were shooting. And you would shoot once, and then they'd all shoot back at you. These were not accurate. If I was shooting at that wall and shooting at one of those little flags there, I probably could not hit it with this from this far. But they also carried rifles. Rifles have a kind of a spiral cut on the inside. It spins that ball. So if you're throwing a football and a soccer ball, which one is going to go the furthest and be most accurate? Football, because it has that spin on it, right? And that was a difference. So a man with a rifle could hit one of these flags like two football fields away, but it took longer to load it. We'll show you how this works a little later. Questions over here? This is called a haversack or your possibles bag. This is what you had on you. This is where your food went, your extra socks or stockings. They're called leg stockings. They come up to about here. Oh, oh God. Okay, and those are called leg stockings. This is a neck stocking here or stock, this black thing under here. Whoa. And when you went into battle, you got rid of that because you couldn't turn your head. And these guys needed to turn their heads to see what was coming from the side. So they got rid of their stock. But, and the, these black things down here are called uh, spatter dashes. They're like for like snow boots. So it yeah, it's kind of to protect your boots and your and your socks from sticks and stickers and tree branches and stuff like that. But my daddy uses it for nothing. Sure, and you can get them up to about this size because cavalry tended to have these because they were up on a horse. Um, but that became what was called back a hundred years ago spats. They look just the same, all these, all the contemporary spats are just like that high. Okay, so you also in here had your food, your socks, your sewing kit. You were only given one of these. So if the Revolutionary War lasted six or seven or eight years, you did a lot of sewing patches. Remember I said no electricity, right? Uh -huh. This is a lantern. I'll open that up here in a second. But when you're walking down the pathway at night in your town, which has about 20 houses, and it's made out of tin. Tin's very prevalent at that time. It's like soup can, all right? If you have soup cans at home, 
That's 10. This is 10. You can take a knife and punch a hole in here. Okay. What? Really? Yeah. Why does it have like, different designs in this table? We're getting to that. Good question. What's your last name? Young. 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 Your family would put a Y in here. No, it's a J. Ooh. J would really throw them off. Oh, like J-U-N-G? All right. Okay, so you're walking down the path at night with this, and you have a letter J in here, or a star, or a circle, or a half moon, or three stars. Somebody walking this way towards you could tell who you were, or what family you were from. And it's the same as that. There's a candle in here. There's like different designs all the way, like on each side. Sure. You can see a circle. And... I love the candy. You can pass yeah. that around. Is you, is you the right? other thing you have was this. Parchment. Parchment paper. Parchment. Pass it around. Where do you wish to Go to a stationery store, again over at Flatirons. Is it like some style of food bank with us? What? Like the stuff that goes on cookie trays? It could, yes. So parchment back then, did they use it for baking? No, it was paper. Paper. What do I got here? Well, Because they didn't have pens. They had pencils a little bit. So you had your inkwell. What did they make ink out of? Berries. What kind? What kind? Probably the, whatever color you wanted your ink. Black and blueberries. So if you, if you got blackberries, blueberries, and however you mix it all together, that's how you got your ink. These are goose feathers. All right. This is the most popular kind of feather. I wanted to show you a few other uh, types of uh, materials that we, we would use on ships. We would, of course, have a ship's lantern. Uh, many of these, the great thing about these types of things is they're impervious to the wind because we have uh, glass on three sides. The fourth side is a mirror, and I can, sh I can shave myself during the day with this mirror, and the door allows access, of course, to the candle as well. Um, for discipline, we would use something called count of nine tables. So if anybody got out of hand, a master has to control the ship or everybody perishes. So if anybody does not conform to the rules of the ship, they must be disciplined. Um, I wanted to be able to show you our boarding apps. These are the types of things that we would board the British vessels with. Um, finally, I have a, a, a sextant. This is the way we would navigate. We used this to determine the stars in the sun and know where the ships were at any given time, which, which when combined with a chronometer, which is also called a watch, a watch or timepiece, would tell us where we are. So with that, uh, with that covered, um, I would like to point out two more things, I guess. Various toys we would also be able to bring back from our treks abroad. This is what's called a whirly gig. And it's something children would play with. And you could make it run back and forth, and see if your friends could do it. Of course, you could also play with um, a cup and ball and try to catch the ball in the cup. I think this one is defective. I'm going to have to take it back to France. And you could also play with uh, a little whistle. When the Revolutionary War started, after the Boston Tea Party, all of the ladies, all of my friends, all of the ladies determined that they would not drink tea, that they would drink coffee. So coffee beans were brought in, and they were ground, and then you could have your basket, and you would pour your grounds in, or you would put it into a coffee pot, and you would dump the whole bunch of grounds in, and then heat up the water, and then carefully pour it into your cups. This is what's called a candle mold. And the candles were all made either at a person called the chandelier, or they were made at home. This particular candle is a beeswax candle. 
It is made from the honeycomb, which we would use all of the honey first, and then the children would even be able to take a piece of honeycomb and chew it as chewing gum. The trencher is a very interesting dinner serving bowl. It was used in two ways. One, you could make the bread rise and it would be held out for the bread. And once the bread had risen, you would take the bread out and put it into your, your open oven. Then when dinner was finished and there was a big stew on the fire, the mother would go over and she would pour the stew into the trencher. And then bringing it back to the table, they would bless the meal and it would be given to the father and he would eat out of that trencher. It would go to the mother, to the eldest child, all the way down to the baby. If there was anything left in the pot, it could then be refilled for second time around. If this trencher was not clean, that is where trench mouth comes from. How many of you kids are Cub Scouts, Boy Scouts, Brownies, Girl Scouts? You ever heard of flint and steel? This is what you use. This is a piece of flint. It's the same kind of rock that's in the musket. What else did they use flint in? How about arrowheads? So this is your match. One of your first chores when you get up in the morning is to make sure the fire is going in the fireplace. So if you're in a family of like six or eight kids, somebody's job is to make sure that fire's going. Somebody's job is to make sure we got plenty of firewood. We'll get to getting water next, but they did not have inside plumbing. They didn't have lights either. Some days I get lots of sparks, some days I don't. So, anyhow, this is a flint and steel. This is a steel, and there's your flint. Make sure, no, other way around. The steel is to cover your knuckles. There you go, now you can strike it. Assistant here. Pass this around. You saw this on your field trip, right? Mm -hmm. And what is this? Mm -hmm. That's tea. That's how tea came. There's a picture of China. On this side, they'd press all the water out of it so they could carry more on the ships. On the other side, if your family couldn't afford the whole thing, are little blocks on there. Those are called cards. And maybe they only bought a card of tea then. And that's how they made tea. But this is it. So they taxed all kinds of things then. We were pretty angry about that. They kept putting on taxes and taking our money. But chores, you all had chores, you all worked hard. I think if you get up in the morning now, you can like turn something and water comes out of somewhere, right? If you want to drink water and need water to cook with, pretty simple to just go like this. Back then, the first thing the boys did in the morning was they put on a yoke. That's what this is. Went on your shoulders. There was a bucket on both sides and you were hoping that there was water close by because if that well or the pond or the stream was a mile or a mile and a half away, that's how far you had to walk with your buckets and fill them with water. This would be like walking from here all the way down past Safeway, maybe down to Waterton Canyon every morning, filling two buckets with water. So now that weighs 60 pounds, almost as much as you do, and walking all the way back to here was 60 pounds just so you had two buckets of water to use in the day. Were they buff? Were they what? Buff. I think mostly they were tired, more rather than buff. So that, <laughs> everybody be in pretty good shape. You I did, didn't squat so didn't, uh, didn't eat very much? You wouldn't have time to do squats. You'd be working all the time. The last of our overlapping sections includes the history stories. And these stories may be 
given at any point during the whole presentation where the students' questions may bring up the subject. With the first graders, we basically let them play with the toys and the household items. And we tell them that they too may have ancestors that were heroes and famous people from the Revolutionary War. However, as the students get older, then more detail is added into the history stories. Most schools have the colonial and revolutionary periods briefly discussed in their curriculum in the elementary and middle schools. And it is common for the teachers at that point in their curriculum to request our society to provide a presentation that would complement their normal studies. We divide our history stories into three segments to give the students a perspective of time. And again, depending on the level, we go into more detail the more they understand. Our first period covers the time between Jamestown and the French and Indian War. Briefly discuss 150 years of colonial settlement. And then we talk a little bit about how the English and their colonies fought the French and the New France settlements over the American territory and that both sides had Indian tribes supporting them. We fought a war before the Revolutionary War. All of the European powers fought a war that was called the Seven Years' War. Here it was called the French and Indian War. And all the main powers in Europe were fighting over who got to keep what colonies. Here, in India, in Africa, all over the place. On this continent, the English had what were the 13 colonies that we're most familiar with, right? France owned Canada, that was part of France, and Florida belonged to Spain. So we fought a war called the French and Indian War. The French couldn't afford many troops and didn't have many, so they used Indians as their soldiers here. And we fought them for almost nine years here. We won, but it cost the king a tremendous amount of money. He was about broke. The second period in our history stories includes the time between the French and Indian War and the Battle of Lexington Concord. Here we touch on the well-known English acts of taxation and oppression. We try not to bore the students with uh, details about the seven acts, but we do touch on some of the impacts of the more popular ones. These include the Sugar Act, the Stamp Act, the Quartering Act, and the Tea Act. And we also mentioned the Boston Massacre, as well as the Boston Tea Party. He was about broke, old King George III was, when he got done. So he decided he better fill those coffers back up. He better get some money. So where did he go? To his most successful colonies, and that was who? Us? Yep. So he came here. So he came here to start taxing people. All right? So the first thing he did was called the stamp tax from the Stamp Act. You'll learn about these later, okay? So if you wanted to play cards, all of a sudden, if you wanted to play cards, you had to pay the king. If you wanted to read a newspaper, you had to pay the king. If you wanted to get a legal document from a lawyer, you had to pay the king, right? If you wanted to buy paper to do something, right, you had to pay the king. We had taxes back then, they did things for our towns. But just to give the king money, just for everything that was paper, that didn't work, yes. Um, so, um, um, did you have, like, well, did, like, one of your relatives that was in it, like, have, like, a best friend in that war? Well, he was in it, and he had a son that was also in it. And I'm sure he had neighbors around him, okay? Everybody was in it in some fashion. Now, only about half the people in the colony supported a revolution and breaking away from the king. Half the people didn't want anything to do with it. They've been subjects for 140 years. They don't want to leave, right? They were called loyalists. They were called loyalists. So the king had tax collectors for the Stamp Act, right? And what do you suppose we did with those tax collectors? There's Anybody know? On the cards, you can take a look and see what the king's stamp looks like. Do you, know what, uh, do you know what tar is? That black sticky stuff that they put in the cracks and fix streets? Well, what we did with the tax collectors for that Stamp Act, we tarred and feathered them. So we would jerk them out of bed in the middle of the night 
and strip them naked, and we would pour hot tar all over them. It would burn them. It wasn't funny. They'd get bad burns. We'd pour tar all over them, then we'd throw feathers into this tar, and it would stick. So they'd be this big black old thing with feathers all over them, and then we'd tie them to a pole, and we'd haul them all over town so people could make fun of them. You think you'd want to be a tax collector back then? We were showing them, right? We sure were. But the king got so angry, he sent soldiers here. He sent soldiers here. And where do you suppose, who had to put the soldiers up and give them a place to stay? We did. And who had to feed them? We did. At one time, there was one soldier for every five of us. And I might not be able to feed my own kids, but I had to feed the soldiers that were living in my barn or upstairs in my house first. I would have to have soldiers living in your house. Well, I'd, I'd be huh? freezing because they'd be like standing at my house all day. Yeah, but what if you said something nasty? If we said something nasty about the king, they took us outside and whipped us, or beat us, or put us in prison. If we didn't pay our taxes, they did the same thing. That wasn't a good way to have soldiers, because it was soldiers from someplace else that we didn't agree with. We have nothing like that now and don't want anything, right? But they did that, so he sent soldiers over. And that was their job. That was called the Quartering Act, and they put it in our house. Yes? How many people were in the war? Oh, gosh, there was uh, tens of thousands. Probably at one time, I suppose there were 50 or 60,000 of us, and there was probably about that many of the British. And then the king hired German soldiers that were called Hessians, so he'd had even more soldiers over here. And you had a question. Well, remember now, those taxes we didn't like, right? That wasn't fair. So the next thing after those soldiers, we said, you can't do that. We have laws here. And what did the king say then? Another act. And they said, well, guess what? None of your laws count anymore. Only the laws made here in London, in the Parliament. Those are the only laws that count. So he's putting taxes on, right? Put soldiers in our houses. He took away all of our laws and put his own in there. Wasn't so good, was it? And as Chancellor of the Exchequer, Townsend put taxes on everything that we were getting from him. There was another incident where we were surrounding a tax collector's house. He knew what was coming, huh? He'd heard about the other stuff. And he fired a gun out the window and he killed a little boy that was out in the street with us. We're getting angrier and angrier. Shortly after that in Boston, we surrounded some soldiers. And we were throwing rocks at them and snowballs and we were yelling nasty things at them. And they got scared. So they fired our guns. And they killed a number of us. So after they killed that little boy, the soldiers fired in the street, killed a bunch of us. That was called the Boston Massacre. Oh. That's what came out in our newspapers, the Boston Massacre. And the first person killed in that was a man named Crispus Attucks. Has anybody ever heard that name before or know why that's important? Crispus Attucks was a runaway slave. He was working on the docks on the naval yards there, and he was African-American. So the very first person killed in the skirmishes that led up to the Revolutionary War was African-Americans. So we're talking about the things that are happening, right? All the fights and the skirmishes and then the Boston Massacre. This wasn't happening very well. And then the king not only put taxes on that tea, but he decided we could only buy from an English company, the East India Tea Company. So a ship sailed into Boston, it had already been a couple other places, and we wouldn't even let them unload that tea. We said, no, it ain't gonna happen. And the king wanted to unload it. So a whole bunch of our people dressed up as Indians, right? They came from Fannel Hall, rode out to that boat, and they threw where did tea go? Did it come back already? We threw 342 cases of tea overboard into the Boston Harbor, right? There was 100 of these bricks in each one. That was almost $2 million worth of tea in your time. And that was our protest. We're not going to pay the taxes. We're not going to buy the stuff there. Leave us alone. Then the king got really angry. Now he closed the port so we couldn't trade anymore. He put more soldiers here. He said, you can't talk amongst yourselves anymore. You can't meet in groups anymore. Okay? And remember how he took our laws away before and said they were no good? Now he took our governments away and said, none of your governments, your city councils or your colonial governments, none of those count anymore either. It's all going to be my people. So we're going pretty nuts all right now after 140 years of doing things ourselves, right? Next up, the king decides he's going to take all of our, our weapons. He's going to take our weapons. There were armories at that time. At one point, we were good British subjects, 
and we would have armories where we kept all the cannons and the muskets and the gunpowder and everything. We militia, our militias would share those with the British soldiers, right? The king decides he's taking all those guns away so that we can't have them and we can't defend ourselves. First, they're going to head up the coast in New England. And a man named Paul Revere rides up there. Did you ever hear of Paul Revere? Yeah? Well, he was an express rider. He was a silversmith. That was his main job. But he also belonged to lots of organizations. Masons and the Sons of Liberty. Six or seven different organizations. He knew lots and lots of people. And he knew the British soldiers were going up there. So he went up there and told them. And when they got up there, all the guns were gone. Then they decided, shortly after that, they would go to Concord, Massachusetts. Right? They'd go through Lexington. John Hancock, one of our founding fathers, and Sam Adams, another one, had escaped Boston where all the soldiers were. They thought they were in Lexington. So the general said, head through Lexington. If you find those guys, you arrest them. And you bring them back here so we can have them hung. On your way then, go further to Concord. So Paul Revere knew they were going, and off he went with a man named Dawes, William Dawes. And they stopped at every house and every church and every town along the way. And what did they yell while he was riding by? Do you know? Some people think he was yelling the British are coming. But that wouldn't have made sense because we were all British back then still, right? There was a poem later that said that's what he was yelling. He was yelling the regulars are coming. The army. That was the best army on the earth. And they were coming to get our guns and they were stopping in Lexington to see if they could grab two of our founding fathers on there. So they got to Lexington first. All we had back then, we didn't have an army. We had militia back then. And so about 70 of our militia showed out. They stopped, attempted to stop the army on the road in Lexington. There were 800 British troops on there. So in Lexington, nobody knows who fired the first shot, but somebody did. And those British soldiers opened fire on our militia. And again, they killed a number of people. Okay, fathers and sons. Our militia were regular old farmers, right? Blacksmiths, working people, shoemakers, just regular people. And they killed a bunch of them. Okay. So on they go to Concord to get where they thought our, our guns were, right? But there was another man named Prescott who lived in Concord. And he was visiting his girlfriend in Lexington. And he knew the British were coming too. So he went back home and told them. So by the time the British Army got to Concord, there was nothing left. The big guns were already gone because Paul Revere had been there a few days before. And now as, as a result of this, they took all of the muskets and the gunpowder and the musket balls, rifles, and they buried them in the fields. So when the army got there, what did they find? Nothing for guns, did they? But the other thing they found because of them running that whole way, Paul Revere and Dawes, that's good, 4,000 militiamen had turned out just overnight. So when they got to Concord, there was American militiamen behind every rock and every tree and every fence, and we fought them all the way back to Boston. And we killed or wounded 300 of them. Now, we're British subjects to that point, right? Bad things have been happening. Some of us are getting killed. Nobody really wanted to be a separate country yet, though. We just wanted them to treat us like British citizens. Now what do we do? We just killed or wounded 300 of the best soldiers in the world, of the king's soldiers. Whoops. Can't get out of it now, can we? Now we got a war. The third period of our history stories covers the time between the Declaration of Independence and the Bill of Rights. And here we briefly touch on the Revolutionary War and the mention that there were 180 battles between the Lexington and Concord battle in 1775 and the Yorktown siege and battle in 1781. It is also encouraging to the minority students that are in the audience to hear about 5,000 blacks who served with the colonies and fought side by side with the Continental Army. Also, it is encouraging to hear about General Galvez and his 2,000-man army of Hispanics and Creoles and blacks and Native Americans that fought the British in Louisiana as well as Florida. And it's also good to mention that the Hispanic presidios in Texas, New Mexico, and even in California provided logistic support and financial support 
to the Revolutionary War. How many years ago was war? That would have been about, it, it ended in 17, it started in 1776, right? So we're 200 and how many years? 40? 240 years ago is what happened. Where is the war located? Where is what? The war located. It pretty much started in Massachusetts. But then it spread all through the 13 colonies. North into Vermont, it was in New York, in Pennsylvania. It went all the way down through Virginia and Georgia, the Carolinas, all the way that way. And in the end, it was all the way into areas you don't think of as colonies yet, all the way into places now that are like Ohio, pieces of Illinois, Kentucky. Kentucky. It was in a lot of different places. How old do you suppose Thomas Jefferson was when he wrote the Declaration of Independence for us? And that's an important document. Was he an old man? What do you think? Not at all. He was like, I think around like 1718. He was 33. But he wrote one of the most important documents in our history. Others like Alexander Hamilton, 22 years old. Ben Franklin was an old geezer. He was in his 60s. General Washington was in his 40s. But most of our founding fathers were about the age and some even younger than your parents. Was there any, like, girls in the war? Yes, there were. Like fighting? Yes, like, like, there were. People? Now we're going to talk about that. Well, even though you didn't go to school, lots of parents thought it would be very important for their daughters to be able to read so they could read the Bible, maybe, or so they could help with the business. So they taught them how to read, okay? And what happened when the men had to leave the farm and go fight the war? Who had to run the farm? That's exactly right. When they left the business, if they had to, and went to the war, who had to be there to run the business? The yeah. And in the schools for the headmasters, maybe, there. And there were women that were called camp followers. And actually what they were was ladies that were maybe wives or girlfriends. At one point, there was about 30 women for every 1,000 soldiers that would come along. And they would wash clothes. And they would cook. But that was terribly important so that the soldiers stayed healthy. Oh, were like kids fighting the war too? That's a good question. Yeah, they were. That's a good question. Now, there were kids as young as 12 or 13 in the war. Usually they were, you got to pass that fife around. They might be playing a fife or drums. This looks like a flute, huh? Mm -hmm. But this is so shrill and it's so loud that this could be heard above gunfire. So they had fife and drum corps, and that would command the army. They could hear this up to two miles away over gunfire. So if all the troops are going this way and the general wanted them to turn, there was a different cadence the drums would play. The fife player would play a tune on here, and that would signal turn and go this way. They would play right? drums to eat. They would play drums to go to sleep. They would pay, play drums to get up. They would play drums to load your musket. So they, they each of these drums calls meant something different to the soldiers in the line. So maybe 12, 13 years old to do that, right? But there were some young people that wanted to, to enlist, and maybe they weren't old enough. They weren't 18 for some of the combat units. So there was kind of a trick they had going with the enlisting sergeant. Now you had to be, had to be 18 to fight in that combat unit, in that infantry unit, right? Now in those times, just like now, you had to be honest. You couldn't tell a lie. So if that recruiting sergeant said, are you 18 years old and you're only 16, what'd you have to tell him? Yeah. I'm not 18. So there was a trick they both played. If you were going in, you take a piece of paper and you would write the number 18 on this piece of paper and you would fold it up and you would put it in your shoe underneath your foot. So that number 18 is now under my foot. I'm standing on top of it, right? So am I over 18? Huh? I'm standing over the number 18 because it's under my foot? So that sergeant wouldn't ask, are you 18 years old? To make me lie, he'd say, are you over 18? Am I over 18? Yes! And now I'm in the Army. So there were some young people in there. And they found out pretty fast that that's not where they wanted to be. If you'd just been on a farm all your life and never been more than a mile away, that would seem pretty exciting and adventurous, wouldn't it? Yeah. But then what if you got there and suddenly there's 500 of the best soldiers in the world coming at you with bayonets? Wouldn't be so adventurous then, would Scream it? Scream and run. There you go. <laughs> <laughs> oh, 
Um, how'd you load the cannon? You would, uh, and first... How big were those? Oh, they use all kinds of things. Some were this big and some were this big. Some exploded. Most of them did not. It was just a giant steel ball that they'd shoot down through the troops. And it would be bouncing along the ground and it would knock legs off and arms off and cut people in half. It was terrifying. It was absolutely terrifying when they'd shoot a cannon at you. That was one of the main things that they, they did with that, yeah. So the very first person killed in the skirmishes that led up to the Revolutionary War was African American. Later on in the war, they'd play even a bigger part. Rhode Island had entire regiments that were African American, so they were participating there. They fought on both sides because both the Americans and the British promised them their freedom if they would fight. Sometimes it happened, sometimes they were just fooling them. But they were on both sides there, so they were participating. How about Hispanic? Any Hispanics you suppose were in the Revolutionary War? Yeah, not so much in New England, but elsewhere. Spain also owned New Orleans, the mouth of the Mississippi River, controlled that river. We needed supplies. So Spain, Hispanic people, were important in keeping us in supplies. In this part of the world, if you study Colorado history, right, you know they were exploring Colorado over by Grand Junction in the 1500s. They had forts out here. In New Mexico, and Santa Fe was a presidio, that's what they called them, also in California and they kept us supplied. So they all did that. So it was all range and types of people. When the war ended, <clears throat> it took years before we had a second document come about that told us how to set up our government. After the war, we were 13 colonies and we weren't part of England anymore, but everybody just kind of ran on their own and did their own thing. We needed it to be one country, right? So there was a document then that was written and that came two years after the war, and that was called the Constitution. That was our Constitution. So you had the De Declaration of Independence, made us free. The Constitution did what? Told us how to set up our government, right? So we have three different things. We have the President and the Executive Branch. We have the Courts, and we have the Congress that makes laws. They all have the same amount of power, so no one of those can take over and run the whole show. That had never been done before. Those were pretty smart guys for young guys, weren't they? There's no country on the face of the earth that has a constitution like ours or anything like that that has lasted all the years that ours has. In closing the presentation, we often give a copy of the SAR booklet, which has the Declaration of Independence and the Constitution to those volunteer students who put on the colonial clothes and helped us in the handing out of the items from the chest. We try to leave the idea with the students that these documents are very special in the world's history. And they are the foundation for our country and the freedoms that we have. So whose job is it to keep this country on the right track and going the right way and getting better all the time? The president. Nope. All of you, that's a great answer. You're gonna be adults pretty soon. You are Americans, right? There is no government, the government is you. The government is you, you elect them or you serve as part of that government. Our founding documents, the Declaration of Independence, the Constitution, and the first 10 amendments to the Constitution are the Bill of Rights laid out how we would govern, or govern ourselves, even here we are 250 years later. We're not perfect, but we can change how we do things based on these documents. If we did not have these documents, we would still be part of the English crown and Queen Elizabeth would be our leader. Why do we need to know history? Why do we need to know about what has happened before us? We need to understand it because we need to understand what we have today, the blessings we have today. The unique thing about the American Revolution was that the assumption was, as we created our new government and we got our independence from Britain, was that a virtuous and educated people could govern themselves. This was an entirely new thought back in those days. We did not need a king. We did not need a sovereign. We did not need a single person to tell us what to do. We could govern ourselves. The significance of the 
American independence that was declared in 1776 and our adoption of our Constitution and Bill of Rights that was adopted by the 13 states in 1789 are the basis of our government today. Remember, we the people of these United States of America. And referencing the preamble to the Constitution is that we the people, including the students that we have just presented to, must always protect these documents and, their, and our country's freedoms. We hope that your observations of our presentation techniques have been helpful. And we firmly believe that helping these students to learn about the beginnings and the foundation of our country is one of the most important contributions we can make. Thank you for watching.